All right, so you've made a movie. What do you do then? Marketing, distribution, all these kind of things start playing a role. And today we're going to talk to an expert in the marketing end of the movie business. He's done the Chronicles of Narnia, Blind Side, Gravity, tons of major movies. And we're going to talk a little bit about what it takes to get your movie actually in front of people. Today we're talking with Jonathan Bach, who's the founder and president of Grace Hill Media here in Los Angeles. His job is to market movies once they get made. Um, welcome, first Thank of all. Thank you. Lucky you to your audience to <laughs> have me on. Oh, totally. It's going to be great. And by the way, John is the co-writer of our brilliant book, The Way Back, How Christians Blew Our Credibility and How We Get It Back. That's going to be a big factor today because we've spent a lot of time slugging it out in the writer's room trying to get this thing to market and we had a great reception for it and so we've uh, been together we've been friends for a long time i hope you talk about that book on every podcast every, every <laughs> well i should no question about it all right let's talk about the entertainment industry for a little bit yeah. first of all how did you get to hollywood well i grew up in los angeles okay uh i went to school in connecticut and okay uh, i was in a uh a comedy improv group while I was there and like every college okay. senior you go through the what am I going to do with the rest of my life what, what, what did you major in I was a religion major oh you were okay I was yeah and so uh, I had the thought you know what I like doing I like sitting around in a room with other funny people and coming up with <laughs> funny stuff what's a job that will pay me to do that, to do that? And sitcom writer was the job. So I came back, I started writing, I started uh, working odd jobs. My first job was for a huge television producer named Bud Yorkin. So how did you get in that door? Um, it's one thing to write, it's another thing to actually yeah, well, get paid I mean, for it. I mean, I, it was a friends of friends thing that I got the job. I mean, it, I was a gopher for, yeah. for Bud Yorkin, but he, he was- uh, He was he, huge. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he and Norman Lear were partners. They created uh, All in the Family yeah. and Maude and Jefferson's and all those kind of shows. Not a bad training ground. Yep, and so that was my first job. And then I got a job um, with a production company over at Warner Brothers, and I was writing the whole time. And uh, they happened to produce uh, a lot of those like ABC family Friday yes. night shows, <clears throat> uh, Step by Step and Family Matters. Yes. And one of the ones that they had was a show called Hanging with Mr. Cooper. <laughs> and uh, I pitched some Hanging with Mr. Cooper episode yeah. ideas. And they said yes. And oh, wow. so uh, my first writing job was writing on Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Wow, that, that's legendary stuff the right there. The episode where Mark buys a cursed car, that was me. <laughs> where everybody's seen that episode, it's classic. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so um, where did you go from there? Well, then I got myself a writing partner, oh. and uh, we went through the writers, uh, Warner Brothers Writers Program, the Paramount Program. We got on another show um, on an, a show called Duresta on the now defunct UPN uh, yep. network. Okay. Uh, the episode that we wrote was uh, up against the Super Bowl, and at the oh. time we were the lowest rated episode in the history of network television. <laughs> that's, that's a good record to have. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And then um, I broke up with my writing partner, and then I had something else happen, which was that my father died okay. uh, rather suddenly, and all of a sudden the world didn't seem so funny anymore. And uh, so I wasn't sure if I wanted to write comedy or what I wanted to do. I was kind of just going through a rough period. So I took a job in the Warner Brothers uh, publicity department. Okay. Um, I had no interest in marketing, no interest in publicity at all. Uh, I was just there trying to figure out what to do, kind of hanging my hat there while I was uh, figuring it out because I was recently married. And while I was there- It's amazing we, how being recently married puts a little fire under you as how far about as making that? a salary. How about yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, uh, I ended up um, being there right when uh, The Green Mile yeah. uh, came out, the Tom Hanks movie and another movie called My Dog Skip. Those okay. movies were coming out at the same time. And my boss at the time was the, the head of publicity, and I said to her, uh, you know, I think people who go to church would really like these movies. You should find some company that reaches out to churches or pastors or Christian radio stations. I think they'd like these movies a lot. 
And she said, great idea, let's find that company. And we looked everywhere and there was nobody doing it at all. There was a little bit of outreach from uh, Christian, in Christian music circles, right. but nobody trying to do anything uh, where they were outreaching to pastors. And so I was telling my wife this one night at dinner, and she said, well, why don't you do it? And so... See, that's another wife thing. <laughs> yes. Why don't you do it? Very bright. <laughs> so I ended up writing a proposal and asking them to let me leave and hire me back as a consultant to market films to people who go to church. And in the absence of anybody else doing it, they said, okay. And so they hired me and my company, Grace Hill Media, was born. That's, that's a pretty amazing story. And, and you had grown up in the church because your dad was a famous... Choral director, yes. Fred Bach. Yes, and yes. so you had the background. You had you understood I, the audience. I had uh, what I like to say was three weeks more knowledge <laughs> than all of them had. But I would come into these meetings yeah. where, I mean, honestly, a month earlier, I had been getting coffee for people, and then they'd turn to me and me and say, "Well, now, John, you're the expert on marketing too." <laughs> A church community? Could you tell us? And you have no idea the number of people I interview that because they stumbled into something where they just happened to be understand something nobody else knew about, yeah. they became the expert. Yeah. Well, now, I think that's a really interesting career strategy, actually. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's um, the fun of Hollywood is yeah. that it's still a bit of the wild, wild west. And, you know, they're always looking for new. Yeah. They're always, they, they, they constantly have a voracious appetite for that. So if you can provide something new, it doesn't matter where you went to college or what you did. If they want it, yeah. they're going to they're gonna come get it. I heard Peter Roth, president of Warner Brothers Television, say, I'm sick of people coming to us saying, what are you looking for? He said, we're looking for something successful. We're looking for anything. He said, he said my suggestion is go out, find Find something that nobody's doing. What is that space on television you're not seeing, or yeah. that type of show, or the genre, or the subject that nobody's covering, and go do that. And uh, that really was your career. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I, I started out um, and had a movie with Warner Brothers. Then very quickly, I uh, got a job with uh, Disney on a movie with them. Okay. And then I did a movie with Universal. And so I was thinking, this is great. This is perfect. <laughs> And then that was it. Like, boom, boom, boom. Oh, had really? three, And then it died for a while. And so I was um, painting houses in the morning. Okay, let's, and then, this is good because you launched your career, yeah. what you've eventually ended up being very successful at, yeah. but it stalled. Yeah, well, I think that's true with almost every business. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you open a restaurant, maybe you have a little bump at the beginning where yeah. people want to check out the new restaurant, but you gotta, you got to yeah. be able to sustain it. And so I was having meetings in the afternoon uh, you know, trying to get people to hire yeah. me. And then all of a sudden, I got another movie from Warner Brothers. And then all of a sudden, I had four movies going. And my wife, who was a teacher, would leave at like 6.30 in the morning to go uh, teach. Yeah. And I'd be working away on the computer. And she'd say, bye, honey. I'd say, bye. And then uh, all of a sudden, I'd be sitting there in my pajamas and be 4.30 in the afternoon. And she'd walk back in, and I hadn't left the computer. And she's like, you need a staff. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I started hiring folks. And uh, here so we are. So the lesson is... Be ready for the dead spot. Whatever you launch, you know, within a few months, you may hit that valley. For sure. You be might sell a script yeah. uh, or sell a movie idea. It doesn't mean you're going to sell the second one, but you need to be ready. I mean, a lot yeah. of times, uh, for example, in music, a lot of bands work for years and years and years and years to get a great album. And then they launch it and it's a big hit. And then the record company turns to them and says, hey, we need another album in eight weeks. Yeah. What else you got? What else you got? And all of a sudden now they're scrambling yeah. to you know write songs that, that they so have been true. writing songs for 10 years. So I, you really have to be ready for that I, next I, moment. Uh, I heard some creative advice one time that a great idea is the worst thing in the world if it's the only one you've got. Yeah. You know, always have backups to backups to backups. Because sure. if it goes, people are going to ask, what do you got next? That's For sure. Important. And, you know, listen, you, I know yeah. you've been interviewing um, independent producers right. um, as part of this. And, boy, that's a rough life. Like, it you better is. not be hanging your head, uh, you know, hanging your hat on one movie idea. Yeah. You, you need to have 25 movie ideas going and have all of those balls in the air. Because you never know what's going to hit with who. True. Absolutely true. All right, so so you've you've taken off. Uh, the company's done really really well. Time Magazine has called you the man who helped Hollywood get religion, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, and in in many ways, seriously, part of marketing these movies has been a career of teaching Hollywood 
about the faith audience, about the Christian audience out there. What's that been like? Well, we've been doing it now for coming up on almost 20 years wow. here. And so it's been a, uh, you know, a pretty incredible evolution. Oh, ooh, I'm sorry. Is that a bad word? No, it's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, good. See, the uh, comedy writer still pops out every <laughs> once in a while. Um, it's been pretty fascinating to watch because when we started, um, you know, there, there was really um, no yeah. interaction between these two worlds. Ho you know, we, we sit on this funny fence yeah. where we're, Hollywood is our client, but we're also advocating for the church and for, you know, ad buys right. with, uh, you know, Christian radio networks and things like that. So how do we bring these two worlds together? Well, at the beginning, they were never together, yeah. ever, ever. And so that's where that started. But now here we are 20 years later, and... I mean, there's multiple studios that are actively making Christian content, overtly Christian content, have deals with guys, like all they're doing is yeah. making Christian films. That's a pretty uh, dramatic change. It's come a long way. Yeah. But it's been an education, I, and I've discovered, and at least in my experience, you may be different, but I've discovered so many people out there think Hollywood is anti-Christian, but in my experience, it's just they're ignorant of all things Christian. They didn't grow up in church, they don't really know much about the Christian thing, and so it's more... They're responding more out of ignorance than, you know, tra really trying to be anti-Christian. Yeah, think. I, I would a hundred percent agree with that. I, you know, obviously, there's there's going to be people who have sure, um, you know, some bone to pick for whatever reason. But right. for the most part, uh, I, I have not really experienced that level of bias. I think. And, and frankly, and you're dealing with studios every day. Well, people are also calling me as like the God guy, right? right um, yeah. I'm the, I'm the guy. They're calling for that, so. They already, uh, you know, I mean, I've been in meetings where I'm, one time I was at a meeting at a studio where uh, this executive who's uh, a woman actually is known for having a very foul uh, mouth and a very harsh temper was we were talking and chatting about a project she wanted me to come on to and her assistant came in and told her some bad news and man I heard this woman just lay into her and then as soon as she was done screaming at her she turned and said I'm so sorry where were we <laughs> <laughs> oh that's so good so maybe I get a little bit of a yeah a little I get them on their best behavior you do. <laughs> nobody wants to offend you yeah. well but I think it is interesting to see how far we've come you know I remember I, I was talking in another episode that um Early on in this whole faith-based thing, um, big, big production company sent a couple producers over to my office and said, hey, we heard there's a lot of money to be made in this faith-based space, mm -hmm. but we have no clue what it is. Could you explain what it means? Yeah. And so it's been a lot of education just trying to teach people and getting, and part of it is, What's hurt us, I think, is bad faith-based movies. There's been some Christian movies that were pretty terrible, which doesn't help the cause, ultimately. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, part of the thing that is happening, I, listen, I, I think it's a good thing, is these things started very small. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the money that was to be made was essentially putting a sermon illustration on screen, okay? And the audience that would show up, yeah. that's what they were looking for. But, um, you know, look, things are starting to really loosen yeah. up. And I think it's partially has to do with just, there's just so many platforms that are now True. out there. Also the death of uh, Christian bookstores yeah. has, has really opened things up because Christian bookstore, well, every, every um, model yeah. that existed for making Christian films in the past was reliant on, we got to sell DVDs at Christian bookstores. And so all of a sudden, 50-plus-year-old uh, evangelical women in the Midwest and South had a, a huge influence on the kind of Christian content that was getting made. Ah, and so now that those have died, now all of a sudden that doesn't exist. The model for that doesn't exist anymore. And so I think now you're going to start to see a broadening of the de definition of a Christian film. Yeah, And I think true. you're also going to see... Um, you know, this the filmmaking gets better and better. Every yeah. single one of these, I just watched the Kendrick film, and I thought it was yeah. great, uh, um, Overcomer. Yeah. It's really, really well done, and uh, and I think you're just going to continue to see that. Is, and, of course, the more they make, the more the, you can get better talent, sure. you can get better writers, you can spend more on development. Like, all of these things uh, tend to then make a better product. But you and I also know Christians who are exploring horror, uh, suspense thrillers. There are Christians that are out there trying to do some really 
push the edge on some of these things, which uh, I think is a good thing because it shows the studios that there's a lot broader pond out there of, of content that we call faith-based, yeah. I guess. Well, look, I mean, you essentially have 84% of the country saying that they have some kind of faith. It doesn't yeah. mean they're going to church, right. okay? That is a very, very, very big pool. Okay, and so you're going to have a wide spectrum of, of interests and tastes. That yeah. is not a uniform group of people. And so, especially with more platforms and the ability to reach people on a micro level, you can start to uh, reach out to them with new content. All right, so let's talk about, let's talk to filmmakers for just a minute. You're a filmmaker out there, um, producer, director, whatever, writer. I find an enormous number of particularly young young filmmakers who put all their money into making the film, never thinking about what it takes to market the film later. Yeah. Um, you know, what are some of the mistakes you see out there from a marketing perspective that people are doing wrong? So if you don't know who your audience is and you're relying on, well, I'm, I'm counting on 70-year-old women who love um, Amish novels <laughs> to show up. Well, they're not showing up yeah. to to movie theaters yeah. to see that. They may watch it on Hallmark, yeah. right? But if you're wasting any time pitching that to a studio, when people over 50 are not going to movies, you're, you're dead in the water before you start. Yeah. So being able to articulately answer the question, yeah. who is your audience for this, is very important. Also important is understanding that studios spend as much money marketing these things as they do making them that's a great that's a great line i mean that's worth repeating yeah <laughs> i mean essentially doubling your budget essentially yeah. yeah and and so they're spending a whole lot of investment in making that in, in, sorry in marketing that project so consequently the notion of that there's a single guy who is in the green light chair and deciding on movies that's that's essentially, for, mo for the most part, for most studios, that's over. Okay. They do it by committee now, oh. and uh, it involves the marketing guys, it involves the distribution guys, uh, it involves the casting guys, like it involves a whole committee. As a matter of fact, they call it a green light committee at m multiple studios now, oh, okay. okay? Where all of those folks have input, and if one of them says, I don't think we can do this because I can't sell this internationally, or I don't think we could do this, uh, because I can't get this thing casted or I can't market this, then it dies. It mm. dies right there because you're talking about an enormous investment. Yeah. I mean, a, a place like, uh, this is not the norm, but a place like Disney, yeah. they're not making $50 million movies. They're not making $100 million. They're making $200 plus million movies. They're looking for yeah. Grand Slam home runs eight times a year, every single, every time. single time. And so they need all of those elements to work. They need international to work. They need the domestic box office to work. They need, uh, they need to be able to sell this yeah. as a plush toy. Uh, they, they need <laughs> yeah. to get a ride out of it. And so all of those things are far, far, far down the river from, hey, I've got this great idea for a movie. Yeah. And so if, none of, if one of those things is not working, then they just say no. And so you need to be thinking, much further down the river than I have a nice idea for a movie yeah. uh, and these characters that are really great. Um, you, you need to be thinking about how they're going to go about getting an audience to show up because you spend, you spend what, a year, yeah. a year and a half making your movie and they spend that amount of money? Well, they spend the same amount of money in about three weeks. And yeah. if you don't get an audience to show up week one, you're dead. You're it's dead. already over. And, and, and it does, they pretty much decide that first or second opening weekend how long to keep it in the theater, right? Well, weekend one is going to start to determine whether it uh, theaters are going to hold on to it or not. And this if is you're a theater chain and you have a movie where not many people are showing up, why would you keep that theater in your chain? Yeah. Why would you not bring in the next opportunity that may bring people to the theater? Because they're in the popcorn selling business. Which means if you want to support a movie, you better get out there opening weekend. You better get out there opening weekend. It is the barometer by which all success is measured in Hollywood. That's pretty interesting to know. Uh, and so don't think, I really want to support this movie, but I'll catch it the next third or fourth week or something. Nope. You got to get out there right you gotta away. You got to get out there right away. Okay, so um, marketing in your career marketing to the faith audience has had kind of a, a you know changed over the years had an evolution where you 
marched churches out there in mass to go to a movie you're promoting to pastors i mean how does how does the whole process work when when somebody comes to you and says i want you to take this movie blindside for instance some movie like that to yeah. the christian audience what's the process you go through well first we see it yeah right and see if there's hope anything there <laughs> right there's certainly conversations about budget and, yeah. and expectations uh, you know, sometimes I've, I've been in meetings where they're like, we want the Christian audience to show up and we've got $50,000. Like, well, not going to go far, not going to go far. Right. So, I mean, those, but those, well, th those guys are welcome to sponsor my podcast and I'll talk about <laughs> oh, the movie. Just send them my way. Perfect. Well, then surely all of America will show up. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so that's obviously the process. Yeah. And, and I have previous relationships with all these folks, so we yeah. can have very uh, candid conversations about that. Uh, but then it's really, frankly, depending on the movie. You know, again, we talked about an audience of people that is more than three quarters of the country. Yeah. I don't need three quarters of the country to show up to a movie to make yeah. it a hit. I need a sliver of a sliver to show up, and it can make an enormous difference at the box office. Okay. So, for our purposes with the market, uh, with the marketing that we do. Even to a faith-based audience, yeah. we're, we're saying to ourselves, who's the audience for this? What are the outlets that are going to respond to this? Uh, what are the denominations and pastors yeah. that might respond to this and social influencers that are going to respond to this? And then we micro-target them to get their audience to respond to that. Micro-targeting, because you're right, denominations, Christian publications, media outlets, there's all kind of niches there. I mean, you've got yeah. the mainstream crowd, you've got the Pentecostal crowd, you've got the Baptist crowd. I mean, it's just interesting to see how many niches just within what we'd call the Christian audience there is. Yeah. We, we, on the blind side, we'd, we did a, um, a series of clips and yeah. sermon outlines and a huge screening campaign to pastors to see this movie. And they saw it. And we got close to 20,000 pastors to do sermons about the blind side. Oh, wow. Okay? Which is a, you think, wow, that's a big number, except there's 330,000 right. churches, right? So we, we, we didn't get 10% yeah. of them, right? So, but that's my point, is that you don't need everybody right. to show up. You just need to be very uh, strategic about going after the audience who, that's going to like your project. And occasionally you'll do a movie where you want to create not just a marketing plan, but kind of launch a movement based on that movie, right? And then you go into a whole different Yeah, well, you things. know, it's, I mean, first and foremost, it's got to be about the movie. Yeah, um, you okay. Know, it's, it's, it's tough to create a movement if people don't see the, the movie. Movie. And, and so, yes, we have done things where we're trying to get secondary yeah. uh, action Attention. out of it. Uh, but first and foremost, it's got to be people want to be entertained, and the movie needs to deliver on that. Okay. Interesting. I was at a, a conference recently where we talked about social uh, social entertainment. That's a big thing in the secular world today where, you know, Blood Diamond, remember that Leonardo DiCaprio movie? And uh, th that was 20 years ago, and there were people in the audience that said, I just got married three years ago, but I made my husband, my, my fiancé at the time, make sure my diamond was legit. It was not a blood diamond. People are still impacted by that kind of thing. Yes. Hotel Rwanda is a good example. And uh, so when those things do happen, it does have a long tail because the movement makes it keep con continue on. Yeah, one of the very first movies I ever did was... Uh, a movie called Pay It Forward with uh, oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Helen Hunt and Kevin Spacey and Haley Joel Osment. And we tried to start a movement yeah. uh, out, out of that, which was a Pay It Forward movement, yeah. which people are still doing. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, you see that, that phrase in the culture we, all the uh, yeah. time. Oh, yeah, I paid it forward. Yeah. Well, that's where that came from. Very interesting. Impact, impact. All right, so let me ask you this. Um, when it comes to... to filmmakers again out there do, do you I mean you deal with every kind of movie there is pretty much you deal with mainstream movies you deal with specifically it, it doesn't have to be a Christian movie for you to take it on when a studio comes to no, you no right? we do everything and have done everything from um, you know sweet family G-rated movies yeah. all the way to like hard R horror movies Oh. And everything in between, because there's an audience for it. For that movie. And there's lots of people who, who watch a suspense thriller, like, you know, The Nun, yeah. uh, or The Conjuring movies, or Annabelle. That, there's lots of people who like good versus evil yeah. uh, kinds of stories, and they like to be scared. 
Um, now those, you know, look, horror movies generally are very self-selecting. That's true. Uh, it's very hard to convince somebody who doesn't like a horror movie to go see a horror movie. Right. It's like eating sushi or something. They just don't really want to <laughs> want to go do it. But if that's your thing, yeah. um, then you're going to go. The, the rule we always have, we don't just do any old horror movie. Like right. I'm not going to do Saw yeah. just because a studio Gratuitous asks. Stuff, yeah. our, our rule with those is uh, God has to win. <laughs> in them, uh, you know, the the, yeah. the the evil spirit has to be vanquished in, uh, in the end, and so then we're willing to do it. So, how much has social media impacted the marketing business when it comes to movies? Well, I mean, it's a, 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 a huge line item uh, okay. of m money that's spent uh, either directly with ads okay. uh, or in having social influencers. influencers. Uh, sponsor it. So yeah, it, it plays a, a tremendous part. I mean, s social media, television is still very big. Yeah. Um, uh, and then just word of mouth sometimes is just quite simply just either yeah. paid, paid uh, you know, word of mouth where you're seeing uh, ads or people have seen the movie and then they're, yep. they're sponsoring it all the way to free media stuff where you're getting, uh, you know, uh, earned media like, uh, you know, publicity yeah. and things like that. These are all, the, you know, the the uh, tentpole things that you yeah. need. Okay, so let's go to the book for just a minute because that is so incredibly important. The way back, how Christians blew our credibility and how we get it back. The reason I want to bring it in is because much of the work you do is, is reflected in our book that we wrote together because a lot of the reasons Christianity has lost... You know, how many times have we sat around a, you know, a, a fire pit talking about why Christianity is losing traction in the culture? And um, because you're a marketing guy, I'm a media guy, we've always thought we're not telling our story well, it's a branding issue. But the more we got into it, the more we realized it's just a sales force issue because we're not believing in the product. Yes. And I think authenticity, being real about this, I think whether it's marketing a movie, living our life, if we're not doing it in an authentic, real way, it's never going to resonate with the culture. I mean, people are always going to look at us as hypocrites. Would you yeah. agree? Yeah. Uh, that's one of our biggest uh, problems is that, yeah. like you said, people are just simply, we don't believe in our own product. Uh, I heard Andy Stanley give a sermon from North Point, uh, give a sermon a few weeks ago where he said, when you got your Bible, it probably had your name embossed on it. You were probably 12 years old. Mine did. Someone probably said to you, this is the Bible. Believe every word of it. It's very important. Uh, you know, give this a lot of reverence. And statistically speaking, the person giving it to you had never read the Bible. <laughs> Interesting. Right? And so that's a problem wow. that we yeah. have is that, uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of things that we're very, very hypocritical about. Um, we're, we're showing up to church three out of every eight Sundays. That's yeah. a regular now for yeah. churches is showing. That's 19 times a year. True. Like if you went to the gym only 19 times, you would not be in shape. No. And the same thing is happening. We're, we're not, uh, we're not giving like only 10% of people who are tithing in churches, only 10% of them yeah. are giving 10%. Uh, these are terrible, terrible True. statistics. I think 45% of of Christians, church-going Christians, read the Bible once a month, rarely or never. Almost half of the church-going Christians in America read the main book, the core foundation of our faith, that our, you know, the book that tells us our eternal destiny, where we're from, where we're going, how to have a relationship with God. We think so little of it that we read it, almost half of us read it once a month, rarely or never. Yeah, well, that's the terrible problem, right, is that um, all those terrible things that people are saying about us of being hypocritical yeah. and judgmental, like, oof, largely true. Yeah. We're I, our own worst enemy. You came up with a line in the book, we become the fat guy in the gym that lectures everybody else about health. God, that was such a good line. That was a good line, I have to admit. Most of your lines are terrible, but that yes. was a great line. Uh, but, but I'll tell you what, that line has a lot to say about Christian movie projects because so often Christian films are lecturing when they should be storytelling, right? Yes. We like to portray the world as it should be as opposed to portraying the world as it is. Oh, that's good. And so I, I, let me give you an example from my sitcom days okay. <laughs> of, of what I'm talking about. So when you write a script, particularly when you're sort of beating out a story right. in, in, a, in a room, 
um, you're sort of building to uh, a big scene at the end. They yeah. call it the block comedy scene. That's where they're basically blocking out exactly where the cameras are going to go, yeah. all of that. It's the scene where the guy who's getting married is having his bachelor party, and the <laughs> you know nervous and worried uh, fiance is the one that jumps out of the cake and points at him, but then yeah. she doesn't realize it was actually the other guy's bachelor party, right? Ah, ha, ha, okay, great scene, right? So the problem is, is that lots of times you would be pitching stories like that and you'd say, wouldn't it be great if we had the fiance jump out of the cake? Oh, ha, 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 that's great. Okay, <laughs> let's build a story backwards to make that happen, right? Uh. And the problem with doing it that way is it's an inorganic way of creating a story and it always falls flat. And so... Because you're the, forcing it. You're forcing it. You're, you're, and you're telegraphing where you're going. Yeah. As opposed to, usually the best stories that got pitched where someone would be like, well, yeah, you know, this weekend we were out at the mall and this hilarious thing. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, that's so funny. How can we translate that into okay. this? We have to get better at organic s storytelling. E essentially the mistake that a lot of Christian movies make is they want a guy who's transformed his life. Yeah. Right? Who's found the Lord. Okay, so great. That's the end of it. Okay. And now we need the scene where he's going to do the conversion. Okay, great. And then you're, so you're, you're building you backwards. You're doing the same thing that doesn't work in comedy, which is like it's an inorganic storytelling structure. And uh, it just doesn't work. And so what it ends up doing is you end up having a nice guy who finds the Lord and ends up nicer. Like, that's not a really good arc. <laughs> that's not a good, well, interesting and it, story arc. it doesn't arc. tell me what he came from or how bad he was. Correct. Uh, there's no story Correct. There. So we have to be able to and have the freedom, and I think we're starting to see that happening, of portraying the world as it is, as that's opposed good. to just saying, oh, well, we want it this way, yeah. and so let's only portray a movie that way. But the, the fault really right now with that is the audience. The audience that's going to Christian films wants that, the yeah. nice guy who gets nicer. That's yeah. the storyline they want. And until uh, other storylines make just as much money that are a little more uh, real and authentic, that's really true. then you're not going to get it. Well, it goes back to your Amish story. It's funny. When I, my, my first book came out, I went to the National Christian Publishers Conference, and they had five authors they were featuring. And there was a guy that wrote on financial issues, a guy that wrote on church life, and my book, and then there was some other lady, I think she was a cookbook, and then there was this middle-aged, frumpy lady over on the side who wrote Amish romance novels. And I kind of, I made a joke about her because I thought, what, you know, who wants that? And we each got to go up and we had like five minutes to pitch our book. And then we went back to our tables in the back that were filled with books. And the host came up and said, okay, it's maybe a hundred bookstore owners, Christian bookstore owners in the room. And he said, okay, now that you've heard everybody talk about their book, go and, and have them sign. You know, go talk to the people, have them sign. The whole room got up and in one giant mass went to the Amish romance lady. I mean, just... And not to you? Not to me. Shocker. I was shocked. Yeah, and I, I talked to my agent, and at the time she said Amish romances are the number one genre in the Christian publishing market. Amish romances. So... Yep. Um, as long as you're right, is in and I'm, for people that are into Amish romances, God bless you. Go to, I'm thinking about changing to writing Amish romances if there's that much in in it, but uh, I think until we start being open to a broader, a wider range of stories, we're not going to make much difference because you're right. They may work occasionally on Hallmark, but they're not going to make major box office theatrical yeah. films. Yeah. Well, the good news is is that there are Christian movies that are doing tremendously yeah. well they're just not classified as christian movies like i don't again i don't know if you've seen those conjuring movies right. but they are very respectful of right. faith uh you know it's usually some kind of priest character that vanquishes yeah. uh you know a, a a demon like well that's a yeah, that's a Christian movie. Yeah, uh, very loosely termed, but that's what that is. There's lots of those projects out there. They're just considered mainstream movies. Plus, I'm just grateful to see a movie that where the Christian character is not a pedophile or a crazy person or a serial killer. I mean, yeah. just to see a movie that reflects religious, you know, faith-driven people in the way they really live is a plus just for the perception in the culture. Yeah, and and that's because they know that's an audience that's out there, yeah. so they're, they are respectful. Of it. All right, last couple questions. Um, Netflix, Amazon Prime, we're seeing so many other platforms. Disney launching a, uh, their own platform. Um, how, 
so many movies now are being made that will never go to the box office. They're yeah. not m made for theatrical release. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? How are you adapting to that world? Well, I think for filmmakers, it's a really good thing because I don't think we've even scratched the surface of peak TV yet. There's still yeah. so many platforms by enormous companies yeah. that are out there with billions and billions of dollars to spend, and they're going to need content. So if you're in the content creation business, this is, uh, this is the golden era it is. Uh, for you, for sure. Uh, I, I think our definition of what is uh, a pedigree project still right now is, you know, being a filmmaker yeah. uh, kind of has that top echelon. But listen, at some point in the very near future, one of these platforms is going to break through and have a movie yeah. that, I mean, for example, you know, Netflix, uh, they're doing things and Amazon's doing the same thing where they're they're releasing it just in a few theaters, yeah. uh, enough theaters so they can get Oscar qualification, right? One of these times, that's gonna break through. It Roma almost off. did. Yeah. I mean, this last year, Roma almost did. It, it might have almost won uh, you know, the Academy Award. Yeah. That's pretty significant. I think the moment that happens, um, that's going to be that's going to open that up even more to be a pedigree. We're also place. seeing more things with fathom events. That's an interesting thing to me too. That some movies are breaking through who had started as fathom events, then they end up going to theaters because they were so yeah. Successful. I mean, what a great business I idea. Know. You know, Tuesday nights, Thursday night. I mean, these are yeah. no, sorry, Tuesday or Wednesday. These are dead yeah. dead times in a theater, and to put in kind of a one night only event like it's 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 completely changed the the it's it's actually in lots of cases it's it's holding up some theaters right because all it's of true. a sudden they found another night Goal mine. uh where they're making real money in there so from a marketing perspective what's the last thing you know what one thing you'd leave people with filmmakers creative people uh, what's one thing you'd encourage them with I, I think this which is you have to be thinking through the marketing as you're pitching it so okay. for my staff that calls and pitches movies all the time. I mean, from, uh, you know, speaking to pastors to speaking to journalists. Yep. Uh, I tell them you have about eight seconds to yeah, get somebody's rule. interest. And if you can't get it in that time, it's already over. So your pitch, I'm not saying your pitch has to be in an eight second pitch. I mean, the movie like yeah. Coco or Up, you're not pitching that in, in eight seconds. But, you have um, to capture their attention. Yeah, but you still have to capture their attention if you don't have it. And so you have to, that is marketing, yeah, right? I mean, if you're not sort of, here's my 30 second, if you can't think of like what the 30 second commercial is for this and know how that's gonna be done, you're in trouble. Yeah. Because the people who are making the decisions, that's what they're thinking about. How am I selling this? And you're not just pitching the story, you're pitching the whole, the marketing, the whole package, really. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's not like you have to have all of that um, but you have framed to be out, about but it. you really do need to be thinking about it and, and having a clear sense of how they're going to go about selling this. Who's the audience and how are they going to sell this? Very good. All right, you can go to gracehillmedia.com to find out what John and his team are doing over there, gracehillmedia.com to find out the movies they're marketing and how they do it and find more information. I'd encourage you to go check it out. And uh, as always, share this with people. You know people out there that are creative, who are making films, doing projects right now that have questions about marketing. What do I do once I get this thing made? One of the things I see most often is Christians who bring a film to me and say, I put all my money into this, now I don't know what to do with it, and I have no money left to market it. So you need to get this information to people who need it. Check us out on the blog at philcook.com. And once again, thanks so much for joining us.